Hi everyone. Um, I want to uh, show you my work in progress project that I've been using to procrastinate my normal work in the last one month. So I was not really doing what I should have been doing, and so I was doing this. And it has been a tremendous amount of fun. And there's still huge challenges ahead of me, that is why it's still a work in progress. But I'm quite confident that in a, maybe in a month or maybe a bit later, if I spend as much time as I did so far, I, I can actually break this thing in a fraction of a second. So what is this thing? This is, as you can see, it looks quite, yeah, this is from 1983. This is called a PX1000. It was built by uh, a Dutch company. Um, and uh, it is basically, uh, yeah, this quite nice keyboard with a 40 character one line display. And it has a bunch of little, uh, um, little icons also that show you what the mode is or anything. And uh, the thing that, does, that you don't see on this is that on the back side you have this uh, microphone and this loudspeaker. So whatever text you type in, you can put a traditional phone and then it modulates the, whatever your message is. And you can send it via the phone line to another device at the other end of the phone. Um, and so how is this crypto? And how is this in interest of the NSA? Uh, very simple. Remember, this is 1983. This is a device that was shipped with DES, the data encryption standard, being built in there. And this is 1983. This is really the start of, um, and this is way before the crypto wars. And this product was marketed for um, journalists and, uh, and uh, also the Dutch government was using it. And uh, so it is a strong cryptographic device for its time, really. Uh, and so this is really exciting, actually. But uh, also for the NSA, because when the NSA figured out that this product is on the market, they I think they sent a, uh, some um, intermediary that bought up all the devices on the market so that no one else can buy this strong encryption back in those days, considered strong encryption device. And then they also contacted the manufacturer to please do not uh, sell these devices anymore. And uh, I think a year later, in 1984, the NSA came back with a, with a new firmware and said, this is, this is, with this firmware, you can, again, sell your device and it will do encryption. Um, so this is, this is this device. And uh, I think I'm regularly visiting the exhibitions of the Crypto Museum. The Crypto Museum doesn't have a fixed place. So they have, from time to time, they just pop up somewhere an exhibition where you can look and poke at the extremely exciting devices they have uh, when it comes to crypto history. And uh, at the last event, uh, I actually played a lot with this device and uh, I was talking to one of the, um, the developers of this device. He was quite proud of, of this device. And so it kind of intrigued me. And uh, last year, I, I had some time to procrastinate again, or not, but I was looking for something to and I thought this might be a super nice project. So I contacted the Crypto Museum people if, because they have already a little bit of information about this device, if they can provide me with more so I can uh, develop a crypt analytic attack on this device. Because I mean, this is, um, this is now 40 years old technology and it might be even possible that you can just a naive brute force approach with current uh, computing power might be enough to break it. Uh, so I contacted them if they, if they can supply me with any extra information. And they said, no, sorry, now we don't have time because uh, this was exactly the time when the crypto AG, uh, AG story broke, the, the Swiss company that was uh, owned by the CIA and the BND. Uh, and they were super busy with that story because they were all over the press and running around and uh, showing all these crypto AG devices to the journalists. and. Uh, giving background information. So really they were busy. So I put this on the shelf and I didn't, I, I waited for them to, to contact me or something, but they never really did. Of course, I have to be a bit more proactive, I guess. So 
And then in July, I, I had to do something really that I didn't really want to do, some work. And so I was looking what other project could I start that looks very serious, but is not the thing that I should be doing. And uh, so I just remember this project. And um, the nice thing about this is the crypto museum people actually have a ROM dump of the original DES version of this device. And they also have a ROM dump of the NSA backdoor version of this device. Um, so there's no proof that there's an NSA backdoor in there, but of course, if the NSA replaces DES with something else, there is, uh, well, what else would it be than, than a backdoor, right? So, so I downloaded the dump. And um, I also re read a bit around on the website because before me, there was already, I think in 2014, some bachelor's thesis from the local university in our town. Uh, and the guy was reverse engineering this uh, ROM himself, and he wrote a bachelor's thesis about this. But he came to a couple of faulty conclusions, uh, which I can show you, but I don't really want to, um, it's not really interesting. He, he, he saw some code that he thought that makes a calculation in the accumulator register, but then the, the contents of the register were after the calculation just overwritten. So he thought that uh, the result of the calculation is, is, is just dropped, so the whole thing is, is, is a lot of complexity without any result. But he forgot to take into account that uh, the calculation also has an effect on the carry flag, and the carry flag was later on used, and the, the, the whole computation was only about what the carry flag is, and that is being... So um, this, this was an error in, in this bachelor thesis. Um, but I mean, for bachelor thesis, it was quite unimpressive work anyway, because this guy was uh, reverse engineering this, um, this ROM. So a little bit about the architecture of this device. This device is uh, based on a CPU that is called HD. Uh, 6303, which is a derivative of a Motorola 6503. Uh, the difference between those two is that Hitachi added five extra instructions to the instruction set of, of the CPU, and um, so it is, uh, it is a derivative, and uh, actually the code uses those extra five instructions. Um, um, it is, it is a very minimalistic CPU architecture, and it was really fun to work with it, actually, because it really has four 16-bit registers, of which two are um, more or less uh, implicitly used. One is the stack pointer, the other one is the instruction pointer. And that leaves you with two 16-bit registers. One is the index register, which you can use to point into RAM. And you have eight kilobytes of RAM here. Uh, and then you have an accumulator register which has a high and a low byte, so two eight uh, registers form a 16-bit accumulator register, and that's all the registers you have. And you really just work with with these uh, with uh, with the accumulator and the index register, and that's it. And uh, the instruction set is also incredibly simple. Like uh, on x86, you are used to having uh, operations that uh, you can say. Uh, shift this register left by n bits or something. In this architecture, you don't have that. You can only do shift by one left or shift by one right. And then if you want to do shift by four, then you have to uh, um, repeat this operation four times. And uh, so um, it is a very simple and uh, fun architecture to actually read and reverse. There's not much complexity in there. Um, for me, it was really fun. Uh, what was less fun is... Uh, because I had uh, the bachelor's thesis, and the bachelor's thesis had already some information about some memory regions, and uh, had some information about, because the CPU is known, you also know some hardware registers where they are uh, in, on which addresses. So I started my, my reverse engineering by loading up the ROM in Ghidra, because the irony of breaking an NSA backdoor with an NSA tool is just, I had to do it. But uh, after um, assigning all these memory addresses that are known in Ghidra, I, I looked for the disassemble uh, function, and then it turned out Ghidra doesn't support a CPU, sadly. But there is a, there's actually a disassembler for the CPU available online from, from the 90s, actually, and it still works, um, um, because this CPU is also used for the Psyon 3, and the Psyon 3 has quite a fan base, so um, those people were actually 
uh, working with disassemblers and assemblers since since the 90s, and it's still it's um, from those times this code actually still runs. Um, and so I, I I disassembled the code, and based on the um, the information that the guy in his bachelor thesis already had a few code snippets. It was really, in total, maybe 50 lines or so, or maybe probably less. Uh, but those lines gave me a foothold into the code where the encryption starts, so I didn't have to reverse all the, uh, how the keyboard and the uh, display handling and where is the entry point to the encryption function and everything. So I had a, I had a good foothold to directly jump to where the encryption is happening and just fo focused on reverse engineering uh, the, the crypto code. Uh, and it, the bachelor thesis really helped me with that. Um, okay, I can actually show you uh, how the memory looks uh, in this case. Um, okay. I don't know if, the, if you can see this. So basically, the bottom, you know, I don't know if you see that. So the bottom you have, this is the, these are the hardware registers. Then you have some memory space, some internal RAM, and some external RAM. What is funny is that uh, actually these three uh, memories are supposedly different, and yet the code doesn't distinguish between them. You have one uh, array that actually um, is, starts in one of these memory regions and then leaks over into the other, so uh, it doesn't seem so important. And then you have these hardware registers for the keyboard and the display. And then this is the 8 kilobyte ROM, which implements the whole firmware for this device. Um, yeah. Um, so this is the memory region of, or, or the, the, the layout of the, the memory of this device. Okay. Um, so um, I actually started to reverse engineer it. And uh, soon after I started to do this, I was really, I saw some things that were really strange. I'm gonna show you. The first thing that was really strange is the, the function that does the encryption. It gets a pointer to the text that you want to encrypt. And in the very first operations of this function, it decreases this pointer by one. So you, you want to encrypt some text, and then it actually starts the encryptions from, from the byte before that. And I had no clue what this byte is, because that is not text that I input. And I was wondering, what is this byte? And so I was, I was really um, trying, I, I was like, OK, now I have to understand how RAM is being initialized and what is being put into this place. Um, and so I looked for all kinds of clues online and also for emulators of, because of the Psyon tree. And I actually found an emulator of this uh, CPU architecture. And it turns out that one of the, or the most active core contributors to the simulator that I found is one of the Budapest Hackerspace people, um, or closely associated, if not a member. And uh, first, I, we, I mistook him for someone else that is also a member of the hackerspace, but it turned out it's someone else. And so on IRC, we were chatting about this, and he also became excited about this project, and he also downloaded the ROM and started to play with it. But he was more interested in the DES version and not the NSA version. So I was reverse engineering, and I was wondering about what is the first byte that is being included in the encryption. And so I was like complaining and moaning to this guy like, it would be so awesome if the emulator would support the display and the keyboard, because then I can just start the whole emulation and type my text away, and then I have a breakpoint or where the encryption starts, and then I just see what that byte is. And then the next day, he showed me a new branch of the emulator with a small patch that is less than 50 lines in total, so this guy really knows his hammer and where to hit this device, so he's like really a... Um, uh, he was really good in, in actually doing this, and I, I actually have an emulator that fully emulates at least the l display and, the, and the, the keyboard. So this helped me tremendously because now I just started to type text, and then 
uh, press the code button, which does the encryption of the, of the text, and I hit my breakpoint, and I saw the byte that was preceding my text. And the byte was hex 28. And so um, hex 28 is, is a special number because that's uh, exactly the number of characters the line has of your LCD display. This is the, the margin. So you can set actually the margin of, of the text you type in, but usually don't because why would you do that? You, it makes no sense to set it higher to, than 40, and usually I don't really see a reason for setting it lower. So actually, the encryption starts with encrypting the margin of the text that you want to encrypt, and that is more or less something that people don't change. So you have one known plaintext byte in your encryption, and the encryption itself is a stream cipher. So that leaks eight bits of the stream cipher already. That was uh, an interesting insight. Another insight that came that I also didn't realize while uh, looking at the um, um, at just the encryption routine was that it also extends the cipher text by one byte. Whatever your text you're typing in, it actually prepends uh, a byte that is uh, hexa eight D. And uh, the D is just stands for new line, and on this uh, in this ROM, strings are terminated with the highest bit set to one, because it's ASCII only, and in ASCII only the highest bit is always zero. So if you have set the highest bit to one, that means that's the end of the string. So you also have another byte that leaves eight bits of the key string at the end of the cipher text. So you have already 16 bits that leave from the, the key string. There's one more thing that immediately comes to mind, that since it's only this keyboard can only import ASCII text, you know, there's no way to import any character that has the 8-bit set, because that would also mean that's the end of the string. So that means per character byte, you also need another one bit of the key string. Uh, so there is already a lot of leaky stuff happening here that makes you like, okay, it cannot get much worse than that. Uh, but it can. But there's also some parts which is still puzzling. So we're not, we have not cracked the whole thing yet. But um, so I was um, on a on a on a grand scale. How does this algorithm look like? I have to maybe zoom out a little bit. Okay. Um, can you? Yeah, you can still see the blocks. I think that should be enough. So. Um, Basically, you, this, is, this is the, the stream cipher that this, um, this NSA algorithm implements. Uh, and this is work, I think, that is a continuation of the work of the bachelor's thesis. And I think some people from the Radboud University have been working on this, and they, they wrote, uh, they, they uh, drew this, this block schema of the encryption um, algorithm. So the first thing that you see here, there's four uh, linear feedback shift registers that are 27, 29, 31, and 32 bit long. Uh, and there are, okay, there's okay one preliminary, I think that I forgot. So how do you enter a key into this device? An encryption key. You want to have high entropy for that. And I think the, the, the solution is, is quite genius. Actually, you enter a 16 byte string and then before the encryption, you uh, clear out the top four bits, and you only use the lower four bits and combine those into a 64-bit high entropy encryption key. So, and you ha even have a little bit of, of room to play that you have a lot of ASCII text that all map to the same encryption key, actually. Uh, and so this is what happens, you enter a 16-character key, and then it drops the top uh, four bits in every byte, and then the lower bits are being used uh, to initialize this. And uh, um, there's one operation they use. I can show you that operation here. Uh, this operation, I call it invert low nibble to high. Since you have a low nibble of four bits, you take a complement of the low four bits, and you set that into the high nibble. So it's the, the, all the bits are inverted from the low nibble to the high nibble. That's the operation that you do. And uh, with, uh, 
and I can show you in code. This is already my uh, reverse engineered code, and it's also cleaned up. It doesn't directly map anymore to the code from the from the ROM because they had all kinds of uh, strange things, uh, indexing and uh, uh, loop-wise, doing a lot of stuff very... Um, so the initialization of um, the LFSR is really this, where you take the 16 uh, nibbles, invert them low to high, and then set them to the LFSR uh, appropriate uh, byte, and the last one you, uh, uh, you set fixed to 0FF. So this is the initialization. So the, uh, the LFSR is directly depending on 60 bits that come from your encryption key. Not 64, the last one is set to FF. Um, then you have these two blocks. This is also uh, directly derived from the uh, input key, and that looks like this. I think in code it's much easier to make sense of it. So, uh, initial key uh, I is, is this blue box here. Okay? And initial key I is simply invert low nibble to high nibble by XORing the input key E and input key plus four nibbles. So here you reduce the, the entropy of your input key from 64 bits to only 32 bits because you, you XOR two nibbles together and then you take the inversion and set it to the high. And the same thing happens with the uh, second part. This is this lower blue block. And in this lower blue, blue block, you, you do exactly the same but uh, shifted by four. So you start with I plus four and I plus eight and eight, uh, I plus 12, whereas here you have I and I and I plus four. So this is just in two, two segments doing the same operation. Um, what is interesting, that this uh, really drops uh, the entropy of these two blocks that can hold 64 bits of entropy to only 32 bits of entropy. Um, and this, this does not change. During the whole encryption, these two blue blocks, they stay like this, and they're gonna be used all over for the encryption of every block. And then there's uh, one last block. This is the, the, blue, the yellow block here on the, on the right, with, marked with a C. This is the ciphertext FIFO. This is, when, whenever there's a ciphertext byte coming out, you move this last uh, ciphertext byte into the FIFO, and you drop the earliest byte out of this. And, uh, but in the beginning, you don't have ciphertext, so this has to be initialized to some value. And this is being initialized quite weirdly. You can see that in this line. So ciphertext FIFO is um, initialized to uh, initial key XOR I, XOR initial key uh, 4 in this case, and then XOR by 0XF. But 0XF means that you undo the inversion when you do the invert low nibble to high nibble. So that means that what really happens here is uh, you have in the low nibble exactly the same value as you have in the high nibble. And that is exactly the... So in this you have... Um, in the initial key i you have this value. This is truncated key input uh, blah. And here you take these two values and you sort them by one. And then, that means in the end, if you, if you look at this, uh, there's only 16 values that the ciphertext 54i can uh, map to. And these are these uh, interesting numbers uh, that are um, basically uh, the inverses of each other. So it's like the value of ciphertext 54i can only be 0f or 1e or 2d or 3c or 4b or 5a and so on until it gets to... Uh, it's inverse uh, F0. So the ciphertext FIFO or each of these values can only be one of 16 values. And later on it even becomes, uh, you even know the ciphertext because you know the ciphertext and that goes into the FIFO. But even in the beginning you have a little bit of clue that can leak uh, information about the input key. Um, 
So this is this is kind of exciting. So this is how you how you initialize all these these big blocks: the LFSR, the initial key, and the ciphertext FIFO. And then uh, the algorithm itself it uh, iterates the LFSRs for 32 uh, rounds, and whatever comes out of this it uh, sources the the i and the i plus eight byte of the LFSR uh, rotates them twice to the right and uh, uses that value in this center f function, which is a nonlinear function which maps six bit to one bit. Um, and here, this is another uh, mapping which actually maps four bits to four bits. So here you. The ciphertext FIFO is being sorted with uh, the initial key values, and then whatever comes out of that is being looked up in a, in a mapping table to four other bits, and the two other bits are actually uh, the, both four, nib, four bit nibbles are set to the same value. I can show you that also. It's also kind of uh, interesting. So, but uh, basically, uh, this was the LFSR initialization, and this is already the encryption. Um, so, this is. Um, the encryption and you see the core char current char character starts with minus one. Um, so that's it. And uh, this is the, the LFSR um, uh, round 32 times. Um, we still have to figure out how this works. I, uh, the, the reverse engineering of the LFSR is, I think, key to understanding and breaking this algorithm. Maybe not, we will see. But basically, uh, this, this, it changes at least half of the bits of, of the LFSR. And then we also uh, update, um, this, is, this is how you take the, the values of the LFSR and rotate it. Like, as it says here, this is the rotation, and you take these two bytes. And basically, this is this uh, calculation here. Um, so this is, you take LFSR 7, you rotate LFSR uh, 7 uh, by 2 to the right, and then you sort this with LFSR i, which is basically this, this line here. So this is the rotation here, and this is the XOR. Um, so this comes out here. Um, what is also interesting is uh, you also include the ciphertext. So this is um, this part comes here, the ciphertext. This is being sorted with uh, the initial key one, and then it's put through this mapping table P, and I'm gonna show you how that looks. So you XOR really, this is exactly what I say, this is XORing of the T two values, and then you take these two values and uh, map, uh, map them to, uh, TMP contains this value, and you map them to four other bits, and then also on the low level, because it's four bits, you take the low bit and the high bit. And uh, what's interesting here is if I uh, if I scroll to the right, I can show you some of my analysis here. So TMP is really initial key zero in this if in the first iteration, sorted by ciphertext 500. Uh, but ciphertext 540 is actually initial key 0, XOR initial key 4, XOR uh, hexa F0. So you can simplify this, uh, that it really drops out initial key 0, because here you have initial key 0, but ciphertext also has initial key 0 in it. So that means that TMP is really just initial key four sorted by uh, F0, which really just uh, takes the complement of the high nibble. So uh, an initial key four is really just invert uh, low nibble to high nibble of this truncated input key. I just shorted it to TI key. So this is just where you have the lower four bits, really. So, and if you calculate this, then it's really initial key N is really just uh, can only be one of these 16 values. And that is, again, one of those uh, why, how, thank you for making it easier for me, I think, uh, moments. Um, 
but this really means you have to go through the, the calculation of where each bit comes from. And if you do that, you just figure out suddenly, oh my God, this can only be one of these 16 values. Um, so um, this, is, this is this operation here, basically what you see here. This is what's happening here. Whatever comes out of P is a value where the low nibble is exactly the same as the high nibble. So, um, and there's only 16 values of that. But that's only true for the first four characters where the ciphertext has been initialized in the special way, because later on, when the FIFO is being filled up with whatever the ciphertext is, then this is of course not true, but then you know what this value is. Here we don't know, we only know it's one of those 16 values. Later on you will know this more exactly. So this is, this is quite interesting. So you have these two things, here's coming out something, and here's coming out something of the LFSR. You have these two sides, and these two sides are being interleaved. You take uh, four, there's bytes coming out of these, right? So you have uh, uh, four bytes are being taken out of the uh, linear feedback shift register here, and there's four bytes taken out of the linear feedback shift register there. And um, you take P1, P2, P3, and also from the LFSR, LFSR out one, two, three, and you don't use uh, the zeroth one. And you can also see that here, this is not. So you only have three uh, of these outputs from the left of the right, and you take the first bit of, of each of those bytes, and you interleave them into a six-bit value. And you use this six-bit value to look up in this F table the value that it maps to this one bit that comes out of this mapping table. And you do this for each of those bits. And the, map the mapping table actually has a separate mapping for each bit. So really it's a function which has as an input uh, bit zero of x3, uh, bit zero of y3, bit zero of x2, y2, blah, and blah. And then also as an input is uh, the bit itself that is now, this is bit zero. So in the mapping table you get uh, a byte back really, and then you take the zeroth bit of that byte as your output. So this is really eight lookup tables compressed into one. Uh, and this is compressed into, in total, only 64 bytes, um, which is quite, quite nice, but also very common uh, in cryptography. This is, this is actually uh, a non-linear function uh, obfuscating the output of a uh, linear feedback shift register, and this is a common thing to do. Um, and basically, that's more or less it. There's only one addition that you take the... This is a fixed value here. This is the... Uh, initial key value that never changes, that you XOR into whatever comes out of F, and you take the zeroth output of the LFSR that you also XOR into what comes out of F, and then um, you, uh, I don't really know what K is doing, I should look that up, but uh, it's, uh, my code is equivalent to what the ROM does. Uh, and then you just XOR all of it with the plain text, and uh, that is the ciphertext, and you put the uh, the, the ciphertext byte into the ciphertext FIFO and you start the whole thing over again. So this is the algorithm uh, on a block schema level and uh, this is uh, the algorithm um, as I showed you. Uh, here is the lookup table thing where you take one value from LFSR out and the other one from this P buffer. You interleave the bits then you look it up in the lookup table and you take the i-th bit out of this lookup table and that is going to be put into your accumulator and then you this this line is really equivalent with with this XOR, whatever comes out of f and x0 and f x0 this is this is what it's doing and you can see actually um, at the end of my lines i regularly have these these codes, this is the mapping and where this operation is happening in the ROM, if you want to look it up. And uh, here I do some calculations also how this looks uh, and where it comes from and what the values are. And um, I'm trying to figure out where bits come and contribute to, uh, to figure out a way. And then this is the final part. I think this is the, oh yeah, this is the, the rotation that you see here. 
before the final encryption. Uh, and then this is the this is the XORing of whatever comes out with the plain text. And uh, that's the algorithm. And uh, that's the end of this file. Um, but there's a lot of uh, little uh, comments, and uh, these are the lookup tables. This is also a kind of a cheat. This is just a 16-byte lookup table, but in every iteration, they rotate it by one, but instead of rotating the index, they just start indexing from the next byte, because if you see here, 0b starts, it starts with 0b here, and it starts here also with 0b. So if you start uh, in the next operation from this index, then you leak over and then into the next end. So this is like uh, a cheap way of doing a rotation by lookup indexing into a lookup table that is um, repeating itself. And this, this is the, the 6 bit to one bit lookup table. Um, and this is the lookup table for the 4 bit to 4 bit. Um, there's nothing else to it. Um, I can show you the emulator, which is kind of fun. Uh, what's TMP again? Oh, the TMP is just a random, it's just a placeholder for calculations to make the code more readable. But I can, I don't know which TMP you mean because I uh, use it all of the time. The what? Before you saw to get the key and the ciphertext, uh, the, the key gets rotated and then the key Yeah. What is the table? So here I set TMP to the output of the lookup table. And then this is an 8-bit value, and I only need to take one bit of it. So here I take the, the eth bit of TMP and put that into the accumulator. And so there's no TMP after this. And here TMP is the current character um, plus one, and only the lower uh, nibble. And I... Uh, the current character is on the side. Current chart points to the plain text. And uh, this is basically, uh, we rotate uh, the accumulator left by, or oh, the current chart is actually a pointer, or a, a, a counter, how many, the ith character that we are now indexing, or that we are encrypting. So this is basically, uh, uh, a mod 16 uh, of the current uh, character that we are, um, or mod 8 actually, it's a mod 8 of the how many character we are encrypting, and the plus 1 is because you start from the minus 1 th character, uh, and then the accumulator gets rotated left by the uh, current character position modulo 8. Um, that's actually, actually exactly this, this operation. Um, yeah. So, last thing that I can show you is the simulator, which is kind of neat, I think. Um, this is how I started. Um, basically, this is... This is the ROM itself and the S19 format, which is a Motorola format of having a uh, ROM in, in a hex. I can show you that actually. So this is how it looks. Look. Not even binary. And, and uh, then you have a map, uh, which is just uh, names for addresses in RAM. And the last one is the code that the simulator my, my commands that I pipe into the simulator, uh, which is kind of interesting, because it's like, this is uh, nopping out, no, this is setting some values in RAM, uh, and this is setting some values in RAM. Uh, this is actually nopping out some, some code in, in, uh, in, in my app ROM, and this is also nopping out the sleep operation in app ROM, because the emulator cannot uh, emulate the sleep operation. Uh, and then I have a bunch of breakpoints that I'm commented out, but here's an interesting breakpoint for some reason. And with, uh, with this ESCI, I can input directly um, um, characters into the keyboard buffer that are going to be read out. And so I enter, I get into uh, 
enter key mode, I set the key for the encryption, and then I exit the uh, set key mode. And uh, here I would be entering the, the plain text that I want to encrypt. And this li last one is, is a go run this code. And this one is actually showing the first two, 20 hex, 20 characters of whatever is where the plain text was. That's it. And uh, so I'm going to run this. And so it's a bit simple, but basically every time I press a key, the display gets updated, and that's what you're going to see. I already set, uh, oh shit. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah, I have no scroll back. Okay. Uh, okay, then I have no scroll back. I'm sorry. But basically, uh, I can set a new key. So I press Ctrl K. This is entering a new key, and the new key is then fix 1000 CR password, which is basically the same. And uh, with Ctrl key, I edit the key, and now I can type some test. Hello, can plus plus. And then I can encrypt it. Uh, and it asks me to confirm. And now I have it encrypted and it says it's seven, 14 bytes. And now I can go and look how that looks. And uh, my simulator says at this address the encrypted text is this. Which is, I can confirm the first byte B1 is the encryption of the character hexa 28, which is the, the margin. And the rest, I cannot confirm yet. But basically, there's this, there is, as with all LFSR-based streams, are there's some other something that involves a bunch of equations. Solving them if you have enough bits that leak from the string cipher, and then you can recover the uh, state of the LFSR, and then you can um, guess the password and you can decrypt the whole thing uh, knowing the password. Um, figuring out these equations and figuring out the linear feedback shift register is work in progress and maybe we'll see it in the future. My, my goal is when we have this that um, um, I'm going to send this message over to the crypto museum people uh, encoded as a modem sound from this device in a WAF file with the password as the file name and so they can play it into their device, uh, decrypt it, see the message and the message is going to be we have all this and we can break it, send us a reply but don't send us the password and uh, that's, that's my plan um, to, to uh, disclose it to the crypto museum people in the end. So, um, yeah, that concludes my almost half hour. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but I probably don't know them. Uh, what were the differences between the, uh, the original firmware and the NSA? The original firmware used DES as an encryption okay. and algorithm, and this is this homebrew stream cipher based on LFSRs. A little bit off topic, but do you know how the NSC uh, incentivized them to use this particular cipher? Yes, by taking off the DES version from the market and only allowing this to be marketed. Oh, there's one historical uh, interesting thing here. that This device was also used in uh, Operation Vula, which was the anti-apartheid movement in the 80s, and which was using this device to communicate with Nelson Mandela in his prison cell. So there is this geopolitical aspect of this device. There, it was a civil society activist in the Netherlands, Connie Bram, a woman. She was uh, in the center of fighting apartheid from the Netherlands. And she was also in the center of, of this Operation Vula. And she recruited uh, a KLM stewardess codenamed Antoinette, who was passing messages back and forth between South Africa and the Netherlands. And uh, they were using this device also for uh, communication amongst each other um, in this operation. So 
there's this geopolitical aspect uh, where the NSA might be very much interested in actually reading the communication. But as far as I know, the Operation Vula people had contact with some people from Philips that recommended them this device, but they also said they should get the previous version, not the one that is on the market now. Uh. Back in its days, what do you think? How hard uh, would it be reverse engineer the algorithm? Because we now have emulators and uh, debuggers, but you said this is a really old device. Yes. And what was your question? Uh, how hard would it be to reverse engineer this algorithm and find the, the back door? Well, well, reverse engineering took about three weeks to get from the from the from the disassembly to having C port and to having C port that actually encrypts to and encrypts exactly as the emulation output does. That was about the work of two or three weeks. Um, but breaking, uh, I don't know yet. Uh, probably if I'm called up to Anjou, then it would take me one day because I wrote a book on breaking these kind of cycles. But I am not, so I first have to read the book before, before I understand it, and then, so it takes me probably a bit more. Um, but there is a book on this, there's a chapter, I can actually show you that, and I should actually. Um, so this is the book, I warmly recommend it to everyone and buy it. Uh, and this is this is the Bible if you are into into crypto analysis on an algorithmic uh, approach, not brute forcing or anything. Uh, and he has actually this chapter thirteen. Oh no, twelve attacks on stream ciphers. Uh, so um, chapter twelve. And uh, I can, can actually zoom in. Uh, it, it already starts with LFSR based key stream generators. And, uh, and uh, this is the important part. In the, throughout the rest of this chapter, we are mostly going to study the security of one particular type of LFSR based stream ciphers. These are the filter generators. And the filter, the filter of the generator is this nonlinear mapping function of n bits to one bit. And uh, the rest of this chapter is like 50 pages and it gives you six or seven different ways to attack these kind of uh, ciphers. Uh, and it's a, this book is, is really the Bible. If you're into this, this is the book that you want to read and have on your, on your bookshelf. Um, there are some variations and he, um, he gives those variations and gives also attacks. Um, it's, uh, it's math. You will. Yeah, uh, so there was this uh, ciphertext buffer that you talked about. Yes. Uh, it, is it only used uh, as a buffer for, uh, for the keystream uh, generator, or is it actually the buffer that uh, gets outputted from the, from the whole thing? No, um, so the plain text is being stored with whatever, whatever comes out of this whole construction here. And, oh, okay, uh, so it's just the stream generator that is being XOR in the yes, end of the Yes, test. here the output of this XOR, here in the bottom, this, oh shit, I cannot highlight, okay. So this part here in the bottom outputs the ciphertext byte, which you put into your ciphertext, uh, into your message, but you also take this byte and put it into this FIFO for later inclusion into this algorithm. Okay. So, so the later bytes are dependent on the previous bytes? Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. But the later bytes then you know the ciphertext that are being used here and the only unknown become these two parts here. Yeah. And the LFSR. Please? Now what's the maximum message length here? Are we talking 40 bytes or does it work? 
Uh, well, theoretically, the maximum message length is the is uh, limited by the LFSR's um, 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 cycle size. In theory, that would be uh, two to the twenty-seven plus twenty-nine plus thirty-one plus thirty-two. Um, so that is somewhere around uh, 128 bits, a little bit less, I think. Uh, so the maximum message length in theory, but I don't, I, I don't know that yet. So this is also part of, of figuring out. But in theory, you can have LFSRs that, that have two to the end uh, uh, cycles. Okay, so your, your message so can be longer than the two to the end cycles, actually. Sorry? So your messages can be longer than four. Yes, but the device only has a space for 7.6 kilobytes. So there's a physical limitation of the RAM in this device, which is 7.6 kilobytes. The rest of the RAM is being used for, for the operating system or whatever you call it. If I may re-ask one of the previous questions, I believe the question was how hard it would have been to discover and reverse engineer the backdoor at the time of the release of the backdoor device. That is a good question, and I don't think that uh, LFSRs have been studied back in the 80s as well as they are today. Uh, because today we know, we don't know any LFSR based uh, encryption algorithm that has not been broken. Uh, GSM and uh, a bunch of other places where LFSRs are being used for cryptography, they all are broken. Um, so I think we now have much more um, knowledge and experience in breaking LFSRs than we had back then. So I think back then, actually the, the whole thing has been shown to the engineers, the Dutch engineers with this device, and they had looked at it, at this algorithm, and they said, this is safe. But those were engineers. Uh, they were just implementing this also uh, from a specification. I don't think they are competent to have uh, an opinion if this is safe or not. But. Uh, uh, even the Dutch government was using, I don't know if they used the, uh, the backdoor device or the desk device actually, but the Dutch government also used this device. So, if there's no other questions, wish me luck that I break this soon.